Okay, my name is Gary Malone. I'm the Mental Health uh, Commission and Transformation Manager for Morecambe Bay CCG. And I've got colleagues here who will introduce themselves as they, as they come and do their part of their presentation. So we, we looked at, I was fortunate, the ICC Development Leads uh, approached us in Morecambe Bay and wanted to focus this particular work on mental health. And when you start to think of mental health mile wide, inch deep, it's, it's enormous to start with. So we, we really struggled to focus down inch deep because every time we did, we found another mile, as you can imagine. So what we, what we did was we focused on an area that we could actually understand in terms of some data that we could work on. So we chose to look at, through the quality outcomes framework, the physical health checks for people with long-term mental health problems or severe and enduring mental health. And when we identified that cohort, we could see from our performance, if you like, that we were 19% of the population that we had in that cohort of people were receiving a physical health check annually. A target of 50%, so it wasn't really a good start in terms of the information that we were looking at. We then were quickly able to see through the work we did that there's lots of different data sources, lots of different variation, which wasn't really given as a true picture of what we were faced with. So we thought we'd focus on um, giving our uh, attention to the population with people with severe and enduring mental health problems so that they could have a better outcome for their physical health check. So we took it straight into that health and well-being arena so that we could focus on people in the community to give them better outcomes for their physical health, which impacts on their mental health. Also, 40% of that cohort of people have long-term conditions, so respiratory COPD, musculoskeletal problems, all sorts of various uh, long-term conditions as well. So we were sort of looking at it from a, an integrated physical and mental health perspective. So the progress that we've took so far, that we, you know, obviously we established our project team that everybody did. Um, we engaged with practices, but we narrowed it down to four practices so that we could actually get a focused outcome, so that we can start to work on a sustainable and an exemplar group of practices that we could then say that works at a neighborhood level and then uh, move it up through our ICP. Um, in order for us to understand what we want to do, we did a literature search. We had a public health expert that helped us with this, uh, XGP, that carried out a literature search. What actually is best practice for this? What should we be really focusing our attention on? And it's a quite, it really is a comprehensive literature review of, of SMI, which we will share across if people want to see it. And it's a really good piece of work, which then directed our thinking and the way that we wanted to work as well. Um, we developed an interview template because we needed to understand if we were gonna do this to people, if you like, because this is a project, let's, let's improve the outcomes of physical health checks at a target, because there's 19, we've got to improve it. What's it really like? Are the physical health checks any good now? What, the, what is the quality measures for people? So we needed to do it from patient focus or a person focus as to what we wanted to try and achieve. So the, the interview template and the interviews we had with people actually changed a lot of the work that we did. So we did it through a continuous improvement uh, approach. There's no chance this is gonna be 15 minutes. So. Hi there, I'm John Glover, I'm Chief Information Officer for Bay Health and Care Partners, and that's why I get a little bit around uh, talking about some of the data that we worked with. So, uh, so the first thing we had to do was really to gather the data, and uh, like lots of the data in our system, there's multiple versions of the truth, and that became a real challenge uh, for us. Um, we also benefited from, from the data that we got from Optum, and I'll talk uh, in another slide in a second in a bit more detail uh, about that and, and, and how useful it was to, to our project. We certainly think it's got use for us in terms of benchmarking and measuring our progress uh, going forwards. Um, in terms of uh, the data that we had, there was... Uh, real inconsistency in the way that the data was being captured and how it was being recorded in each practice. So one of the outflows from our work will be in terms of standardizing that in our uh, initial four practices, but then growing that more widely, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. In terms of the variation in the data, um, we took it from four different sources. So we took it directly from the GP practice systems. Uh, we took it from our community data warehouse. We looked at the data that our Primus team had collected, and also we measured it against uh, uh, the Optum data. Now, we knew from the outset that the Optum data would be different because it was 
<clears throat> excuse me, it was built around um, acute data rather than um, the whole of the, the cohort of the patients we were looking at. But as you can see, there was variation, and we're still trying to understand that variation in, in something which, broadly speaking, should be, uh, should be identical. Um, the last thing, again, it was mentioned a second or two ago, is about uh, the learning sets. And they really helped us in terms of being able to, to get some coaching support, giving us time to kind of reflect on what was going well, what was not going so well, so that we were constantly improving and adapting as we went through uh, the project. In terms of specifically around um, the learning um, from the Optum data, so uh, I'm not going to go through all of these bullets, but um, those kind of first points um, was really at a level of it didn't really surprise us. It was stuff that we anticipated and actually most people would. But actually, or most people who have got some insight into this, but it was really reassuring, I suppose, that, uh, to, that, that, that it backed up our perspectives and our anecdotes and, and some of our experience. Um, one of the things we really learned, and something that we're constantly now thinking about taking forward, is about that segmenting of data. So instead of looking broad brush at one data set through one lens, is actually, if we break it down, how much more is there to learn? And certainly, one of the things that we, we, we anticipate will be better to understand how physical health checks help uh, patients with SMI in different segments of, of the population. And the last thing really, again, was focused our attention on, uh, on the quality of the data and what we needed to do to standardize uh, clinical coding. And uh, that features very much in our kind of next steps, which I'll talk about in a second. I'm going to hand over to Matt now, who's going to talk in a bit more detail about some clever stuff uh, that he's doing. Excellent. Uh, so I'm Matt Hayes. I'll be very quick. Oops, I've gone too far. Not that quick. Uh, so my name is Matt Hayes. I'm the business intelligence and data science manager at, um, in the Morecambe Bay area. Um, so first of all, we wanted to look at the coding disparity. Uh, so I generally hate Venn graphs, but these actually worked quite nicely to illustrate. Um, so as per the uh, table on the previous um, chart, on the previous uh, slide, uh, there was a difference in the number of codes and the number of patients we were picking up. Um, and we found that when you look at the various different ways of identifying SMI patients, there's different amounts of uh, SNOMED codes that you can pick up to actually identify these patients. So QAF's quite huge, it overlaps quite a lot with NICE, which has quite a lot of codes, and the MILM, um, so a, a registered purely just at the MILM practice, uh, is in another smaller cohort. Uh, then when you actually look at those in terms of patient numbers that it pulls out, NICE, even though it's slightly smaller than QAF, actually pulls out thousands and thousands of patients with SMIs. So we decided that wasn't a good way of looking at it, uh, whereas then the QAF and the MILM, uh, they're very close, but they do overlap. Uh, there is some disparity between those. So that's something we need to do going forward, is talk about um, one way of coding SMI patients across the whole of the patch. Uh, in terms of the other stuff we did as part of the project, um, we're looking into the data science side of things. So we've got loads of data, um, so we can do some interesting things, as well as trying to improve SMIs uh, and care for patients. So we looked at two different questions. One was, can we identify patients who may have undiagnosed mental health conditions? Initially, we're looking at depression, uh, just because it's a bit more understood. It's a single condition. Hopefully moving on to SMIs, but they are multiple conditions. So we have to look at it in lots of different ways. Um, also, depression is very un undiagnosed across the population, um, whereas SMIs, it's a, bit, um, it's a bit more obvious when someone has an SMI, or it's a bit, uh, it's a bit easier to pick up. And the second question what we wanted to answer with data science was, can we identify patients at risk of exacerbation? So for example, attempted suicide, ED attendance, self-harm, et cetera. So can we actually identify these people so we can do something about it before these things happen? <laughs> um, so we did some exploratory data analysis. We took all of our patients from the community data warehouse, about 300,000 in there at the moment, worked out who has depression uh, based on the fact that they're currently on antidepressants and they have a depression code against them. So that's roughly about 13, 14% of our population. <clears throat> And then we basically explored the data around them. So we could see that an increase in BMI generally corresponds with an increase in the likelihood of being depressed. Uh, females and males, more women, uh, are being diagnosed as depressed at least. We think that's both a reporting bias in that men are crap at going to the GP with problems in general, uh, but also crap about talking about mental health. Apologies for saying crap so much. Um, uh, I'm a liability. I don't know why they gave me a microphone. Um, uh, 
age band, there is this sort of profile where it increases up to sort of um, 40s and 50 year olds, and then it sort of tails off a little bit. Uh, deprivation index uh, is, let me use the laser pointer, this bit here. Uh, to the left hand side, uh, it's a very much heavier than uh, average uh, deprivation, uh, sorry, depression rating. So if you're living in the more deprived areas, you've got a higher likelihood of being depressed. If you've lived in the more affluent areas at the end here, um, you're far less likely to be depressed. And then we also joined into the acute data to find that actually, if you have just one ED attendance in the last year, you are higher than the baseline of being depressed, likewise with open access plans or open waiting lists that you're on. Um, so we sort of took this data, and given the time, I don't need to go into too much detail, because you'll all understand this. Um, um, it, this was just meant to try and confuse people and look fancy. Uh, but essentially, we were doing some logistic regression modeling, and we're moving on to other bits and pieces. So basically, we put all this data into, uh, into R and do some modeling, and then we find out the factors which are important. So stuff like BMI obese uh, increases your likelihood, and it's statistically significant to do so. Whereas other things like uh, the proximity to leisure centers, that's not actually that statistically significant for our patients. So you might think that green spaces, for example, might uh, make it more likely that you won't be depressed. Uh, it doesn't really make a difference in our model is what we found. Um, I won't go into the too much detail about this, but basically we're finding that we're really nicely predicting people uh, with depression or not. Uh, actually, we found out that um, of the 371, uh, sorry, of the, all the patients that we're predicting, we're really good because we can predict 13,000 patients don't have depression and they don't, whereas we're just about predicting 371 people do have depression and uh, they actually do. So we need to do a lot more work to actually refine that. Um, but this is the exciting stuff that we can do with data. We can do a lot of this predictive stuff. And I will hand back, apologies for talking so much. So, so we have progressed things a little bit in terms of our, our responses to um, working with the people with SMI that have come to our uh, physical health check project. Um, we developed a, a patient letter and information leaflet, which it, that's just a standard letter, but it actually took some work to write because we needed to word it in a way that lowered the anxieties of people with the, with the mental illness that weren't coming to practice for their physical health checks to reassure them that it's their choice of whether they take the tests or whether they actually come to the, the appointment, but trying to stress the importance of that engagement. We then worked that into a, a, a more, well, again, this took a little bit of work and it's still under, under work at the minute to try and make it more accessible in our communication for people with severe mental health problems, but also making it user-friendly that we can place in various practices and, and other areas that we can do. So we answer the, you know, the questions that they may, you know, we, we try to work out, do I have to take part? Well, it's entirely voluntary because it's your health, but it's your well-being that we're trying to promote. Um, will it be kept confidential? Well, obviously, because you're in the general practice. So it's all these which seem easy answers, but they're not to people that potentially uh, are isolated in the community with, with various conditions, long-term conditions and overlapping psychosis or, or, or bipolar conditions as well, so or whatever the, the SMI category might be. So we developed the, an information sheet that which we shared, and this was used in the engagement with the people as well as they attended practice on an opportunistic basis as well. Um, we developed a patient leaflet, um, which I've clicked to. I knew I'd do this to you. I've clicked it too many. I've got to leave it alone. Have I? No? Do I? I don't know. You did it. Click. It does something, hang on. Oh, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so what goes into the leaflet, that bit, which I ran out of time to read. Um, uh, why is it recommended for you? What so, you know, so all this information is in, these, these are the leaflets that sit in practice that you can pick up. Family members can share, they can pick it up. General practitioners can handily give it to somebody that's actually come in for maybe a medication review or whatever it may be, took the opportunity to take the BMI and at the same time give them a patient leaflet. There's a whole range of information that goes alongside it that, that may be used to people because they've got such varied needs, whether they've got um, coping strategies for substance misuse, you know, uh, substance misuse as a result of coping strategies, um, access to drug and alcohol services might be necessary, they've got um, COPD or breathlessness as part of their long-term condition, there's, there's opportunities and British heart failure and so on and so on. So we're trying to match the physical needs as well as the mental health needs at the same time, as well as carrying out their requirement to have a physical health check annually, which is their entitlement under our, our um, improvement and performance targets, whether it's CCG or provider. But we, it's something we should be doing anyway for people with long-term conditions, and particularly those, the cohort of SMI. So 
We also have developed a patient feedback questionnaire because as part of our continuous improvement cycle, we wanted to understand, we've put this in place, is the leaflet any good for one thing? I, was your physical health check any good? You know, what was it like? We've got various feedback for that. Some <laughs> people are okay with it, other people didn't realize that they could bring a friend in order to have that physical health check. They thought they had to go on their own. So, so something as simple as that, that actually improved somebody's access to their general practice, practitioner, which is remarkable when you think that, you know, it's not something I would have thought of, that you could take somebody with you. We, during the project, we had our public health worker meet the people after the physical health check, go through the questionnaire and ask some direct questions about how it was. That was voluntary. People did participate in that, and we got a quite a comprehensive review of that. That's actually been written into a research paper alongside the literature review, so we've got the literature review, and, and now we've got the outcomes of those engagements and the project, which has been developed into a, a wider research paper um, by our colleague. And obviously, we've also got um, staff feedback around that. How can we make this approach more standardised? How can we actually make it more effective for people that are coming through our services? Um, I think this might be over to you now, John. So, just wrapping up in a, in a quick minute. So, uh, so there were a number of issues that we came across getting the team together, um, challenges in terms of the timing when we were doing this. Co it co coincided with uh, year end for, for practices and all the work they were doing. You touched on already some of the inconsistencies in the data. Um, we didn't all understand this cohort at the start, so we've all gone a, on a learning journey. You know, a lot of the knowledge that we've gained from, from Gary and colleagues has been really helpful. Um, the challenge that got mentioned a little bit earlier on about you know resources and real competing challenge between trying to do this work as well as you know deliver the day job and keeping all those plates spinning. Um, complete variation in all of the practices that we touched and we expect that to continue uh, across all the other practices. Um, the Optum data, one of the things we'd look to see for an improvement is a comparison to uh, the general population, um, but that's relatively kind of modest improvement. And we had one practice out of our four that, that withdrew. Um, in terms of next steps, I won't dwell on this because I'll leave it up while you ask us some questions, but really just about how do we sustain this, how do we get it in, how do we grow it, you know, how do we continue to make better uh, what we've already done. And at that point, I'll shut up and we'll take any questions. <laughs>